Let's go. What's up? Excited to be together. I get to talk about something I love to talk about. And that's why the Bible is true and reasonable. So we're going to see some facts today. Picture. There's a lot of slides. Now, if you want to get, you know, see it again, it will be online next Sunday. It'll be up there forever, so you can check it out. Unfortunately, today, that monitor just went off this morning, so you're going to have to look over here. So if you want to move over here to see it, you could do that, or you could just watch online. But this is where all the slides will be today, and we got a bunch of them. So we're going to look at some cool stuff. The first fact I'm going to drop on you right now will blow your mind. St. Patrick is Italian. No, true story. He was a Roman. He was captured. He was kidnapped from Rome, taken to Ireland. He escaped, and then later in life, he went back to start churches there. But he's actually St. Patricio. Let's go. That's actually true, so you could, you could fact check me on that if you want to. I'm sure a lot of you guys will fact check a lot of what I say today, so it's all good. So, you know, you can wear green. That's all good, but you could put a little red and white in, too, if you want to, you know. So anyways, let's get right to it. I want to start Acts chapter 26, which is basically the history of the first church. The book of Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. But what we're going to focus in on here is someone in the Bible called Paul, the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament letters that we would read. He was one of the greatest church builders of all time. But that's not how he began. He actually began as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee, the group of men, the religious leaders who actually put Jesus to death. And there's a good chance he was on that group of people who sentenced Jesus to death. And he devoted himself to trying to destroy the Christian church. He was throwing them in prison, having them killed, because he thought he was trying, he was wiping out this new cult that had started. So that's how he got his start. But then he was met on the road to Damascus by Jesus in a vision. And he was brought to faith by that. It changed his life so much so that the guy who was killing Christians was now the greatest church builder of all time. And so he's such a witness in and of himself. But in this situation we're going to see here, it's a time in his life when he's arrested. He's before the Roman governors. And the Jews had sent them to the Romans to say he, he's preaching stuff against Rome and he needs to be killed. So the Jewish religious leaders want him killed. The Roman governors are like, we don't know about all this Jewish stuff. What are we supposed to do with him? He didn't do anything against Rome, so we can let him go. But he's like, no, I appeal to Caesar. So now he wants to go to Rome and appear in front of Caesar because he wants to preach the word there. So what they happens is, of course, the Roman governors, Festus and Felix, they don't know anything about the Jewish law, so they bring in King Agrippa, the king of the Jews. He knows all of the Old Testament, the prophecies. He grew up with it all. And so they bring him in, and they're like, look, we don't know what this guy's raving about, but you'll know this, so how about if he can speak before you? So Paul here is basically on trial, and he's about to stand before King Agrippa of the Jews and share with him why he has preached that Jesus died, was resurrected. And, and so here's where we pick that up right here. And it's so cool to see how he shares his faith with King Agrippa. Acts chapter 26, verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer and, as the first one to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus, this was the Roman governor, Fest, or Festus, yeah, interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving, your ins driving you insane. You see, Paul was a very learned man. He was trained under Gamaliel, one of the top Pharisees. He was super educated. He was a Jew that had Roman citizenship that was very rare. He was highly respected. And so, so the Roman governor is like, all your great learning has made you crazy, right? And what Paul says here, verse 25, I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. 
and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. You see, they were out there preaching. Jesus was out in the open. He was killed on the cross in front of thousands of people. It was not done in a corner. It was done where everybody could hear about it and see. That was the whole point. And so he's appealing to Agrippa because Agrippa, again, knows the Jewish scriptures and everything, right? So he goes on and says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. Yes! Our man Paul preaching the word. And man, that's, you know, I want to say the same thing. When I, when I share the Bible, I, I hope everybody becomes a Christian. Obviously. I, I want that for everybody. But you know, I run across a lot of people from different backgrounds. Some hate God. Some are atheists. Everybody's got different views of God. And, you know, they all want to argue. And, you know, that's fine. And atheists will come at me hard. And I, you know, why would you do this? You're foolish. You're just speaking to the air. There's no God. All this. So what I always, I always tell guys, I've said this for years. I'm like, okay, well, here's the deal. So if at the end of all things, this is all false. Hey, I'm still good. I had a great life here. I have a church family. I stayed away from sin. So my marriage could be good and my kids could, could love me and I could have a better life. I didn't do stuff to destroy myself. So I'm good. Amen. Right? Yeah. But if it's true, you got some problems waiting for you. So I'm going to be a Christian. But I didn't do it blindly. See, for me, I, I, I look at Paul and I'm like, I could really understand him, where he came from. Because for myself, I was a science guy. I, I was a doubter. I didn't, I didn't need a crutch. I was very popular. I had a lot of money. I had everything you could want. So I wasn't looking for a crutch like people say. No, uh, I had a lot of questions, but somebody invited us out to church. And you know, I think all of us deep down inside think about why are we here? There's something in us that, that money and prestige is not going to fulfill. And that's put in there by God. And so when Tracy and I got together and we both had, we were just, but we didn't know where to go because unfortunately there's a lot of hypocritical Christianity, a lot of bad things done in the name of God. But you know what? That's not God and that's not Jesus. It's people who are not doing it the proper way. So we got invited to this church and the thing I loved about the church is they were, they were very Bible based, right? And so, you know, for Tracy and I, we're like, hey, we, we, we should at least check it out, Right? But here's the thing, here's the problem when you first start out, is that there are liars on both sides of the fence. They're, they're atheists and Christians, Christians alike that throw out crazy stuff. Like, I remember early on, I was talking to this dude, Christian dude, right? And I'm like, what about the dinosaurs? And you know what he told me? It's crazy. He goes, Oh, they never existed. God just put those things in the ground to test our faith. He put the bones in the ground to test our faith. They never existed. I'm like, so God is a liar in order to help us come to faith to be loving and honest? What sense does that make? You know, many, many people say the earth is only, you know, Christians will say the earth is 2,000 years old. Guys, come on. Look, look at the science. It's not 2,000 years old. It's billions of years old. And, you know, so on both sides, I was like, what can I trust? So we, we studied. We just went at it ourselves. We looked up. You know, we didn't even have online. We had to go to the library and check stuff out. Yeah, right. This is when you had to work for stuff, not do, do, do. Oh, there it is, you know. So it's like, it was crazy. But so we had to dig in for ourselves and put aside. Because on both sides of the fence, like I said, the Christians were saying that. And then, you know, there was actually a, a, a professor from a well-known college that said, oh, we found this book, it's this new archaeological find, and it proves that you, you know, it was okay to live alternative lifestyles until it was proven that it was a forgery that he had made just to prove his alternative lifestyle would be okay biblically. So listen, there, there's, there's junk on both sides. 
you got to really dig in, guys. you you got to say, let me take people out of it and just go to God. Let's just go to the facts. And so today, I hope I could just stimulate you to want to dig in a little more. Because listen, I want everybody to get to understanding the love of God and purpose and all that great stuff. But there's a lot of us, we can't get past the fact of, is this thing real or not? I can't even get to the other stuff until I actually believe the Bible's true. So, I hope today it will help you. There was a couple things I, I did when I was a young Christian. I heard about this guy named John Clayton. He has a whole thing called Does God Exist? And I loved it because he was a science teacher who decided to set out to, to scientifically disprove the Bible, but then became a Christian because of it. And there's another one you could find. This guy is awesome. He does a thing called Cold Case Christianity. His name is Jay Warner Wallace. He's been on television, a famous Los Angeles detective. And um, his wife was a Christian, and she kept trying to get him to come to church, and he goes, all right, you know what, finally, this is why he was an atheist. He goes, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat it like a cold case. I'm going to treat it with all the same ways that I figure out crimes. I'm going to figure out if Jesus really raised from the dead. I'm going to figure out if it really happened. So he went in again to disprove, and now is a Christian, and devotes his time to scientifically helping people believe in God. You can look both of those things up. Like I said, everything will be online next week. So let's talk about the Bible. Let's get into it, right? I, I get fired up about this stuff. So the Bible. The word Bible means book, by the way. But in the Bible, there's 66 books, 39 Old Testament books. Now, Old Testament is the time before Jesus, all the way from creation to Jesus. And the New Testament has 27 books, and that's all about Jesus, his life, and then the early church. And so that's the New Testament. So there's 66 books. They were written over a 1,600-year span. Long time, right? Over 40 generations. There are over 40 different authors of the books of the Bible from all walks of life and all kinds of places. It was written on three different continents, in three different languages, and hundreds of controversial topics are covered in the Bible. Yet, there are complete, there's complete harmony between all those parts. That's the first thing that blew my mind. And these, most of these scriptures were written during the lifetime of those who were alive at that time that could easily have reported the happenings. The validity, validity could have been denied and refuted. I mean, look how it is today. Someone comes out with something fake. You can just tear it down, right? Because you're here and you can say it didn't happen. But the Bible is so incredible. It has survived numerous persecutions and outlawings. And I shared last week even about um, Voltaire, who was basically a French Enlightenment writer, historic, historian, philosopher. He lived in the early 1700s. And what he said about the Bible is he said, in another century, the Bible will disappear from earth. It was very anti-Bible, right? 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society was using his home to produce Bibles. Napoleon said the Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power that conquers all who oppose it. The Bible is an incredible book. It's powerful. It has lasted for thousands of years, and it still is valid and powerful today if we just look at the facts. Now, the Bible is true and reasonable. I want to talk about why it's true. Now, there are a lot of tests historically that are done in any documents or any books that are found. There's different tests. There's the bibliographical text, tests. There's external evidence tests, internal evidence tests. I'm going to look at archaeological tests, scientific tests. We don't have time to get into all deep, but I'm going to show you just some stuff that blew my mind that really helped me in my faith, and you can dig in. So the Bible, it's true. Let's look at the bibliographical test. Now, since there are no original documents, we don't have anything that you know, was actually written, right? You know, the original ones, right, that we know of. You know, so how reliable are the copies in regards to the number of manuscripts and the time interval between the original writing and the existing copies we have? So that's the test that's given to everything. Writings of Socrates, Plato, you know, Shakespeare stuff, anything like that. That's the test that is given. So we're going to look at those things when it comes to the New Testament as opposed to all these other historical documents that we easily accept as history. So let me tell you about the New Testament. There's over 5,800 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, and 9,300 in various other ancient languages. We have more than 24,000 copies of parts of the New Testament in existence. Now, you want to talk about this, the, the, the document that has the second most compared to the Bible? Check this out. 
It's the Iliad by Homer, which many of you probably had to read in school, right? It's in second place. <laughs> my, my Greek daughter right there. <laughs> the Iliad is in second place with only 643 manuscripts. Yep, dating to the 13th century. Now, the Iliad was written in 900 B.C. The oldest copies we have found date to 400 B.C. That's a 500-year interval that there was nothing. And the closest thing we found to prove it is 500 years away from when it was originally written. And there's only 643 manuscripts. The Bible has so many more manuscripts that have been found. So much more historical proof to test it than anything. But you don't hear about this, do you? Yeah, right. Dig in. Man, and some New Testament manuscripts are carbon dated to almost the original time of the writings. Check this out. You can see over here. First thing we're going to show is called 7Q4. Now, that's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and chapter 4, verses 3. And these, are, these were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm going to tell you about the Dead Sea Scrolls in a minute. They revolutionized uh, Christianity and the religious world. Because in 1946, well, I'll get to those. I'll tell you about the Dead Sea Scrolls. But anyways, this was found along with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Carbon dated to 66 A.D., Jesus was killed around 33 AD. So within 30 years, we have, we have stuff that's been found that matches what we have today. The next thing we have is 7Q5. Throw that up there. This is Mark chapter 6, verses 52 and 53. Again, carbon dated to 66 AD from cave, uh, cave, one, cave 7 of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, check this out. P52 is the next one. This is called the John Rylands Papyrus. It was found in Egypt. It's now at the John Rylands University. P52 is actually, it's like a page from a book. On the front side, it's John chapter 18, verses 31 through 33. And on the back side is John 18, 37 and 38, which says they already had book things going on already when it came to the Bible. Now, the thing that's crazy is if you know the history of the apostle John, when he wrote the book of John, it was about 90 A.D., he was very old. He was on the island of Patmos when he wrote the book of John. This right here, I'm getting chills as I talk about it. I love it. This right here is carbon dated to 125 AD. Again, within 30 years of the original writing of the book. <coughs> and all these manuscripts read just as we have them today. So let's go to the next one, P64. This is Matthew chapter 26, verses 7 and 8. Verse 10, verses 14, 15, 22, 23, 31, 33. This is called the Magdal Magdalene Papyrus, and it is carbon dated, check this out, possibly to 37 AD, within a few years of Jesus dying. I mean, guys, this is just some of the stuff. But I didn't know about this, did you? You're not told about this. People just, oh, no proof of the Bible. They said, really? There's a lot of proof for the Bible. Right. A lot more than anything else we believe and read. It's incredible what's out there. Sir David Dorimple said this, if the New Testament vanished by the end of the third century, all but 11 verses could be found in second and third century writings of the early church fathers. It was so disseminated all over and widely written about that it was in all kinds of other writings put together by the church, early church fathers. I mean, it just goes on and on. There are so many New Testament documents that they can be compared to one another because there's thousands and thousands, right? Yeah. So they can all be compared to each other. It's the thing that's blow away is that we can be sure of what the proper transmission is because we have so many of them to compare and they all are in harmony. Amen. That's blow away to me. I'm like, wow, you know, as a missionary faith, the New Testament was translated into numerous languages. There are 15,000 existing copies of the New Testament in various languages, and they all align. Come on, man, that stuff fires me up. So uh, let me tell you about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can we just put that up there? You may have heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they were discovered in 1946. There was a shepherd in the Wadi Qumran over in the Middle East, and he was out there, and he was just throwing stones into caves, you know, just what shepherd boys do when they're bored, I guess, right? <laughs> he throws a stone in a cave, and he hears something crack and break. 
So he's like, what is that? So he goes into the cave and finds hundreds of jars full of scriptures. And so scientists, then there's numerous caves filled with them, right? So the scientists, of course, get involved and, and they're famous now, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls. But every book of the Old Testament, besides one, was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are carbon dated to at least 200 BC, at least 200 years before Jesus ever lived. We know all those Old Testament books existed. That is crazy. So check it out. This is uh, 10Q Isa. It's the scroll of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. It reads the same as we have it today. Carbon dated to 150 BC. They have the whole book of, of, the, of Isaiah in there. All the prophecies of the Messiah and how the Messiah would die are all in there. It's crazy. It's crazy, man. Check this out. This is 11 QPS. It's the book of Psalms. It reads today, same as what we have today. Again, found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, dating back hundreds of years. I mean, all of this stuff is so blow away. Again, 40,000 fragments of which 500 books have been reconstructed, including all the Old Testament books except Esther. Sorry, Esther. But the rest of you guys are good. <laughs> The New Testament evidence is far more than any 10 pieces of classical literature together. In all of Shakespeare's plays, 37 total, there are gaps in the printed text, even though they were written in the 17th century after the invention of the printing press. Again, look at the facts. There's so much more proof for the Bible. But let me tell you, that's scary. Because if it's true, and then we got to deal with it. And I knew that as I was digging in. We go, man, I remember Chase and I would be like, I think this thing's real. And we're like, eh, it's kind of frightening. <laughs> like, really need to change my life, I guess. But it was crazy. Like, again, no one of my old friends would believe I'd be here being a preacher today. I was such an opponent, you know, but I couldn't argue with the facts. All right, let's go on to some archaeological stuff. The Bible is true and reasonable. I'm here to tell you that. So let's look at some archaeological stuff outside of that even. So now, for the law, in the Old Testament, there's all kinds of cities and places and everything talked about. And, you know, opponents of the Bible are going to just dog on things and, oh, this never existed. And one of the things is the biblical city of Ebla. And it was said, that never, it doesn't exist. We've got no proof for it. The Bible's a sham. You know, it doesn't you? Until in 1968, they found the biblical city of Ebla. And they actually found its library with 17,000 tablets writing all kinds of history stuff. It, it, it's 4,500 years old, what they found. And this is, listen to all the stuff that, it, that it, it proved biblically, the Bible talked about. It, proved Abraham, it talked about Abraham's victory over the Mesopotamian kings in Genesis 14. It talks about the cities of the plains, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboa, and Zoar. They, all these were disputed until the archaeological stuff proved them to be true. 4,500 years old, all in harmony with what the Bible teaches. Come on, man. That stuff is awesome, right? So let's look at the next thing. It's called the Tel Dan Stone, right? It's carbon dated to the 9th century B.C. It tells of the Mar Aramean king's victory over the king of Israel and over the house of David. Again, people were like, David never existed. I always talk about the house of David. He doesn't exist. We have no proof for it until we did. <laughs> Just like the Bible talks about. Right around the time, this is, that was actually carbon dated to right around the time it actually happened in the Bible. So check this out, the next thing. <laughs> this is a shard found at Gath. Now, in the Bible, Gath was Goliath's home of David and Goliath fame, right? And of course, Goliath doesn't exist. We got no proof for this. This shard right here is carbon dated to 950 BC, right around the time that David was to have slain Goliath. You know what the inscription on it says? Goliath. <laughs> it's within 70 years of what the Bible said happened. Right. We got no proof until we did. Right. Again, this is all scientifically dated and everything. So, right. All right. Check out this next one. This one, many of you might actually know. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder. The sixth century uh, BC is when it was carbon dated to. And so um, it names Cyrus 
as a conquering king, and then he sent the Jewish captives home to rebuild their cities and temples. This is exactly what Ezra chapter 1, verse 24 says. Named Cyrus by name, says he sent the Jews home to rebuild their temple, and now we've got actual historical proof that that happened, just like the Bible says. And it's also 2 Chronicles 36, 23. It says that Cyrus did that at that time. It's right there, historically proven. On this thing that was found, it's pretty famous, dating back to almost when it happened. Like, come on, this is crazy. Like the Bible, everything they find proves the Bible. You notice they don't find stuff that disproves the Bible, or else you'd hear about that. But there's not much that they find that disproves the Bible, right? But you don't hear about this too much, do you, right? All right, how about Pontius Pilate, who sentenced Jesus to death, right? He never existed. We got no proof for Pontius Pilate. That's all garbage. The Bible's a lie until we found this thing, which basically says Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. Again, carbon dated to 26 to 37 AD when Jesus lived and died. It was found at Caesarea Maritima, and it, that's literally what it says. Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, just like the Bible says. It's like, let's just keep bringing more and more over here, right? All right, check out this next one. In, uh, in Romans chapter 16, verse 23, this is the crazy thing about the Bible. It names so many names and places and all these things that are checkable that you literally could disprove it easily because there's so many things that they say that could be checked, right? But so in Romans 16, 23, it says, Erastus, Erastus, the director of public works. You know, Paul was just talking about this guy, Erastus, the director of public works. Oh, he doesn't exist. Oh, until we found this that says, Erastus, director of public works. <laughs> it was found at Corinth, exactly where Paul said he was. I'm like, again, I don't have time to just keep going with everything, but the Bible is insane. It's like so cool. There's so many proofs that we just dig in and get the truth, man, and look at it. It's like uh, the book of Luke which is one of my favorite books in the Bible, I always tell start with Luke. Luke, check this out. It's one of the most highly respected historical documents even to this day. It contains 32 countries, 54 cities, nine aisles, and 95 people who all check out historically and archaeologically. Come on, that's impressive. I'm like, I, I mean, again, the Bible is true and reasonable. And the more I dug into it, Trace that we're, we're like, uh, we're going to have to actually live this stuff. It's real. And I was like, wow, but you don't hear about it. Okay, even scientific stuff. Check this out. Let's look at some scientific tests, right? Because the Bible says a lot of stuff that for years people would say, oh, that's scientifically not right. Right there, it proves the Bible's junk. Okay, look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. It says, when it talks about God, it says, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Now, you say, all right, uh, okay. Why is that impressive? The word circle in Hebrew is kug. It means a ball, a round ball. You see, this is 2,200 years before Columbus said that the world wasn't flat. But Jesus knew that in 700 BC. God knew that in 700 BC when he printed his word, that it is literally a ball. That's what the earth is. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, God. Job 26, 7. Check this out. Job 26, 7 says, the earth is suspended over nothing. You know, the earth is just up there. It's just suspended out there, right? That's what the Bible says. Now, it's crazy because you can look at some Hindu, Hindu writings that say the earth is on the back of ele elephants standing on a turtle's back. That's legit in their scriptures, right? Buddhist world, there's writings that say the world sits on the back of a catfish. Again, you, you can check it out. The Greek mythology, you know, Greek atlas is holding up the world. You know what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches what's scientifically correct. The earth is suspended over nothing. That's what the Bible was writing thousands of years ago. God knows how it all happened. So he gets it right, right? Job 38, verse 16. This is another controversial one. When he says, the springs of the deep will burst forth. Springs of the deep. Freshwater springs coming up in the ocean. Again, no proof of this, scientifically wrong. The Bible again is wrong until they discovered spr springs of fresh water that would pop up on the bottom of the ocean floor. Oh, no. right. Again, God knows, guys. Right. 
He knows. He wrote the book. He knows what's going on. You know, in Genesis, we, many of us know the story of Noah and the ark. God tells Noah to build the ark. <laughs> what he told him to build, it was the perfect seafaring ratio of how to build a boat even today. Exactly what the Bible teaches. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 12, when it says, circumcise on the eighth day. It's scientifically the time you can do it because that's the time when vitamin K and prothrombin levels are high enough that you won't bleed to death. So it's the exact time God knew to say, do it that day. Again, scientifically perfect. And then even the whole creation. People, I don't know if I could believe in creation. Well, check this out. The laws of thermodynamics. How many engineers we got in here? I got engineers. All right, we got a few guys. The laws of thermodynamics. Come on, engineers. The laws of thermodynamics. Laws, not theories. Laws of thermodynamics basically agree with a creation story. The first law of thermodynamics basically says no new matter can be created or destroyed. Everything was just there, and that's how it's always going to be. It just was created. There's no change in it at all. And even the entropy law, the second law, that says things are getting more out of order, even within that, is exactly what's happening in outer space as you look at it. Everything scientifically lines up with the Bible. Just check it out. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the lies you see. And people spout out. Man, I've had so many people, all oh, the Bible, all these contradictions. I'm like, show me one. I remember this college professor at Drexel was teaching the kids my, that were in our church, and I was like so upset. He's like, Bible's fake. It's all this contradiction. So I went in to see him. I said, show me one. One. He goes, well, there's two creation stories. I go, show me where. Well, it's somewhere. I go, show me where. I said, you're spouting off a lot to these kids, which are lies, and I don't appreciate it. And I don't even think it's legally right for you that you should spend your personal opinion when you have no facts behind it. He's like, well, you know, what about this thing? I go, show me, because I can show you right now where it's not true, that it does go together. I, this dude had nothing to say. He was just spouting off what he heard because he didn't want to live it. And then I got in his face about his sin, and he didn't like that either. So, but I was like, you, you are not going to do this to our kids and just get away with it. So I'm like, man, just, just get to it. People say, oh, the Bible this, Bible that. Show me is what I say because I can show you, and I hope all of you who are Christians can learn enough that you can defend your faith because nothing turned me off more than Christians who believe something they don't even know why. You know, so, so it's, it's true. The Bible is true. And the second thing is, I don't have a lot left, but because I can go on forever with this stuff, but the second thing, it's true, but it's also reasonable, right? So let's look at the external evidence test, right? Which is basically about conformity with or agreement with other known historical and scientific things. So like the thing about Christianity that blows my mind is that so many non-Christian writers Writers who weren't Christians, historians who weren't Christians, they didn't have an agenda to prove it. Many times they were trying to disprove it and yet chronicled historically that stuff happened. That's what's wild. So one of the most famous is Josephus. You can put him up there, right there. You could get that book in the library or whatever. But um, he was a Jewish general and he wrote, he was born in 37 AD. He wrote the history of, of basically Jewish and Roman life at that time. He was not a Christian. He, chron he chronicled many events and peoples, just as the Bible did. He wrote about Pontius Pilate, Quirinius, the Herods, Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest, the governor Felix, and Festus, both ones we just talked about with the Apostle Paul, Claudius. I can go on and on with all of the people and places he wrote about that completely align with the Bible. One of his most famous writings that you could see is in his book Antiquities, chapter 18, verse 63 where he literally talks about Jesus. And he said, then came a man named Jesus who was powerful in word and deed. And it literally says that his followers claimed that he rose from the dead and preached that. I mean, we know for a fact outside of Christian writers that he lived, he died on the cross, and his followers claimed he resurrected from the dead. This is all written by somebody who was just writing history. And there it is. I mean, it's incredible. It goes on. He wrote about the James, the brother of Jesus, and how he was died in his book Antiquities. So Josephus, how about this one? There's another guy. His name is Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. That's a pretty cool name, right? <laughs> you see how fast it rolled off my tongue, too? Come on. Pretty... 
Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. It's a song title. I don't know. But uh, check this out. This guy wrote between 69 and 122 AD. He was a court official and historian during the reign of Hadrian and Claudius. In his book, The Twelve Caesars, he documents Claudius expelling the Jews from Rome exactly as it says in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. Again, I put these up there because these are books you could get and actually see that it's in there. Let's go to the next guy, Cornelius Tacitus. He was born in 52 AD. He was a senator, and he was a historian who chronicled Nero's reign as emperor in Rome. In his book, Annals, chapter, 5, ch chapter 44, um, written in 160 AD, 116 AD, he chronicles the fact that Jesus was killed during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate, just as Matthew 27 teaches. Again, not a Christian, just chronicling history. He also wrote in 64 AD that the Christians were made scapegoats for the great fire in Rome that Nero actually started and blamed the Christians on. All historically documented. Then this next one, which is so fitting for the fact that we're about to have a solar eclipse coming above. That's pretty crazy. People are renting hotels here and anything, but that's side point. So check this out. So in Mark chapter 15, verse 33, when Jesus was dying on the cross, it said that darkness covered the land for three hours, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. In the middle of the day, everything went dark. And so, of course, people in those days wanted to disprove that it was a miracle of God and said it was a solar eclipse. Well, it was a solar eclipse. That's all it was, no miracle of God. <laughs> okay, can you show Julius Africanus, that guy right there? He, he was, again, he was a historian back in those days, and he writes about a guy named Thallus, who was a Samaritan historian. Thallus said that the darkness of the land in Mark 15, 33 was actually an eclipse of the sun and not a miracle of God. But again, in so doing, he proved that it actually happened. Right. Now, the thing that's crazy is science is able to calculate the calendars going back in time and figure out that it couldn't have been a solar eclipse at that time. So again, you have this thing that is told about in the Bible that someone tried to disprove and mark down historically that actually proves it was a miracle of God. Right. Yep. Besides the fact that eclipses don't usually last for three hours. Right. That's a whole other thing. So I'm just like, man, you can just, you go through all this stuff, it's blow away, right? Yeah. And so Thallus also uh, is mentioned by Eusebius, Theophilus, and others. The Jewish Talmud, Mishnah, and Gemara, all the Jewish writings, now again, they don't like that Jesus claimed to be a Messiah. They all refer to Jesus many times, although in negative ways, they attribute his miracles to sorcery. But in so doing, they give proof that he lived, made claims to the, be the Messiah, and did miraculous things. They didn't deny that it happened. They just to set, tried to say it was sorcery. But again, historically, it's all there from enemies. Yeah. He's historically documented yeah. to have done these things. That's what's crazy. Uh, the comments in the Barai, another Jewish writing, says actually that Jesus was crucified on the eve of, eve of Passover just as the Bible says. The Bible is true and reasonable. I implore you to check it out, to dig in and actually get the facts because they're there. Literally, it literally changed our lives. Yeah. My whole trajectory of my life was radically changed. When I had to make a decision about do I believe this or don't I? Because I'm an all or nothing guy. If it wasn't true, I'm done with religion. I'm not even going to fake it and go to church. I'm done. But if it's real, I'm in. And I'm all the way in. And man, obviously we came to faith. We're here doing this today. You know, the thing about the Bible too, it's so cool, is that it includes many incidents that it, mere inventors would have concealed. Like if somebody was just trying to, because some people say, well, what if somebody just sat down and wrote out the whole Bible at one time? And, just, and they just wrote it all out and made stuff up, right? It's like, well, archaeologically and historically, that's not how it happened, right? It was, it, anyways, that's a whole other thing. But the thing that's crazy is the stuff that the Bible includes, that if I was writing it, I wouldn't want to include in there. Stuff like the competition between the apostles, and how they were all fighting. Well, I want to be the guy that stands right now on his right-hand side. I want to be, they would argue with each other. Now, if I'm writing a book about myself, I'm leaving that part out. How about you? <laughs> it's like, right? How about the cowardice? How about Peter running away? Yep. Yep. Everybody's, Mark, Mark writes about it. Mark was like his nephew. <laughs> you think Peter would be like, oh, dude, can you just leave that out in the book? Yeah. 
I came back around, you know. I, I had a moment where I was cowardly, but you know, I came back. I died for him later. Like, but no, the Bible leaves that stuff in there. The stupid stuff they would say. I mean, don't you wish sometimes you could rewrite your history of stupid stuff you say? I mean, you know, I love the brothers, and they all died for the faith. So, but man, they said some stuff. Just like we do. But they left it in. I mean, how about when Jesus goes to his hometown and can't do miracles? That would have been a cool thing to leave out. But no, he couldn't do miracles there because nobody believed. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that the Bible includes that they're not trying to hide. They leave all the pimples in there. They leave all the weaknesses in there because it's true and it's relatable. And so, guys, again, you look at all this stuff, bibliography, you look at history, archaeology, science, you look, if you just dig in, the Bible is awesome. And it is real in my opinion. It is true and reasonable. And then in John 17, and for, for me, ultimately, this was a great test. Does it work? In John 17, John 7, verse 17, John writes and says, anyone who chooses to do will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. That's what Jesus said. Basically, try it and see. If it's from God, it'll work. Right. And you know, and we gave it a shot. We're like, all right, let's give it a shot. Right. Let me tell you, our marriage was not headed in a good path without God. God got us back. Amen. Parenting, stress, a lot of stuff we go through as human beings. If we just gave ourselves over to God and just trusted the word, those things would get a lot better. I mean, it, it actually works. I ask people all the time, if everybody lived according to the Bible, what kind of world do we have? And I think everybody would agree. Yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah, it works. It's just because we're idiots that we don't do it. But if we do, we'd have a pretty awesome world. It's why our church can be completely diverse. All races, ages, different economic brackets. It don't matter. We're family. Because we're all trying to be like Jesus. That's how it works. The world without Jesus, I mean, look at it. People killing each other over little pieces of land. It's ridiculous. People starving in places in the world when we have enough food. It's because this is the way to do it. This is the way it works, but we have to choose it. God doesn't want to force people to love him. He wants people to make that decision. But it starts with believing that it's true. Man, it is true and reasonable. And, and, and please, give it the time so that you could come to full faith. Because once you do, then you could get to the good stuff. You could get to how God loves you and the sacrifice he gave Jesus for, that he resurrected, that he's got vision for you, that he wants you to use your gifts, that he believes in every one of us, that we could be unified. There's a way to be unified. There's a way to be family. There's a way to put aside our differences. There's a way to achieve victory in our lives if we do it his way. And so get into the word, believe it, and then apply it, and your life will be radically more awesome than it is. <laughs> it's so cool. So anyways, that was, that's all I can get into today. I'm going to share more about the resurrection on Resurrection Sunday. So. so I know a lot of people are going to be watching online, so I hope this helps you guys too. Anyway, so we're going to take communion together, uh, and I want to leave you back where we started in Acts chapter 26. As you take communion, representing the body and blood of Jesus that he gave for us, sacrificed for us, Acts 26, verse 22, as Paul says, But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. It was prophesied in the Old Testament hundreds of years before it would ever happen. That's a whole other thing I didn't get into today, Old Testament prophecies. Naming the exact place Jesus would be born. Naming exactly how he would be killed. Uh, uh, na how, every, I mean, there's so much. It was prophesied that the Messiah would have to go. The book of Isaiah talks about how he would die. It's all in the Old Testament prophesied that he would go to the cross so we could have forgiveness of sins. Incredible stuff. And the fact that God would do that for us is amazing. And again, I hope you're grateful enough for that sacrifice that it will help you to dig in and just make a decision and then go for it. And man, I promise you, your life will be amazing. Your life will be amazing. Let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful to be together. Grateful that um, your word is so powerful and so real and life-changing. 
and that it is the key to victory, to unity in our world today. And I pray that maybe today what we shared was something that would spur some of us on towards really digging in more and making a decision so that we could then see clearly the incredible love you showed for all of us through Jesus on the cross. It would inspire us to live lives worthy of that grace. We love you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today for service. I am so excited for the year 2024. It's going to be a great year, not only to grow closer to God, but to grow closer to one another and to get deeper in the word. We have so many amazing things coming down the pipeline here at Vessel Church, from great sermon series to cool Bible studies and everything in between. So please make sure that if you're in the Buffalo area, and even if you're not, Stay connected with all of our social media and our website so that you can know everything that we've got going on. We love you. We hope you have a great year ahead. Take it easy and have a great day.